The essence of the gospel is black, not in color, but in condition. Before we can get to reparations, there's got to be a public acknowledgement of the sin of the enslavement of human beings. Did anybody here ask to be born white? Okay, all right. Anybody here ask to be born black? No, right, right. You were born in the skin that you were in. But there's a system at work that we have to identify and address how it is unfortunately and inequitably causing certain people a great deal of damage and destruction. This is a presentation of Metropolitan Community Church of the Lehigh Valley, located at 1401 Greenview Drive in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, under the leadership of Pastor Elizabeth Gowdy. On Monday, June 17th, 2019, at 7 p.m., Metropolitan Community Church of the Lehigh Valley hosted Reverend Dr. Gregory Edwards, speaking on Christian white supremacy. Christian white supremacy is anti-liberation and pro-control, harming generations within and outside the church. Dr. Edwards has spent a great deal of his pastoral ministry helping people of all races deconstruct the inherent American construct of Christianity, which is deeply embedded in white supremacy. And now, Reverend Elizabeth Gowdy. Reverend Dr. Gregory Edwards is founder and senior pastor of the Resurrected Life Community Church, and he is president and CEO of Resurrected Community Development Corporation in Allentown. Dr. Edwards has served on numerous local and regional boards, and his historic run for Congress in 2017-2018 as the first African American to run for federal office in the Lehigh Valley was covered by MSNBC, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Guardian Magazine, as well as now this and a host of other media and social media outlets. Dr. Edwards received his Bachelor of Science degree in Urban Ministry Leadership from Geneva College. He received certification in Community Economic Development from the University of Delaware's Graduate School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. He received a Master of Divinity degree from Drew University and a Doctor of Ministry in Transformative Justice and Public Policy from the New Brunswick Theological Seminary. Dr. Edwards has been awarded the NAACP Man of Vision Award the Peace Pilgrim of the Year Award, the Community Development Award by the Allentown Human Relations Commission, and the William Gray III Leadership Award. Will you please give a warm welcome tonight to Dr. Edwards. To uh, Reverend... Gowdy and members of the Metropolitan Community Church and to all of you gathered here in this place at this time, I bid you good evening. It's okay to talk back to me. Good evening. Good evening. Before I begin, I wanna, I'm want i reminded of a story uh, of a young black boy and a young white boy who decided to attend each other's church services on different Sundays, of course. And first, the black boy went to his friend's Episcopal church, high church and was looking at the bulletin and asking a whole lot of questions. What does that mean? Oh, that's the homily. It's like a sermon, but shorter. <laughs> well, he pointed at the bulletin, what, what does that mean? Oh, that's the Eucharist. It's like communion, but we serve real wine. <laughs> he was asking these questions, so on and so forth. And on the following Sunday, the young white boy attended his friend's Baptist church. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the service, a woman in the back pew began to shout. The boy asked his friend, what, what does that mean? His friend said, oh, that's Sister Jones. She's getting happy and she's feeling the spirit. A little, a little later, a few people said amen all together, uh, out loud. And his friend asked, well, what, what, what does that mean? Oh, well, that means they agree with what's being said. And just then, as he asked that question, the pastor stood up to preach behind the pulpit and meticulously took off his watch, to which the little boy asked his friend, well, what, what does that mean? Him placing his watch on the pulpit, to which his friend looked at him and said, 
Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I, I said that to say that when I was originally asked by Reverend Gowdy how long I have to speak, she said 45 minutes. And as tempting as that original offer was to a black Baptist preacher, I respectfully declined. If I stand before you and speak for 45 minutes after the majority of you most likely have had your evening meal, we'll have folk falling over in the pews, falling out of the pews, and the rest will be respectfully, perhaps, raging. So I'm going to be bright, I'm going to be brief, and then I'm going to take my seat and be gone. Um, in fact, I just have a few opening remarks, and then uh, Reverend Gowdy and I will converse for a few minutes. Uh, and then perhaps more importantly, you have the opportunity to ask questions, and hopefully together we can have an engaging conversation and dialogue. And so, as we are conversing about Christian white supremacy this evening... It does not escape me that today, June 17th, marks the fourth anniversary of a young white nationalist walking into a Bible study at Mother Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and opening up fire resulting in the tragic loss of nine lives. And out of respect for those who must live in the aftermath of that loss, I choose not to mention his name and give him more life. Yet I'm also reminded that it's not so much who killed the Charleston Nine, but rather what killed them. The systemic cultural assumption about the supremacy of whiteness. And so it is with Christian white supremacy, which appears at first glance Beloved, really to be an oxymoron. We know that Christianity is not monolithic and that there are many different doctrines and systems of belief and theologies that comprise the totality of Christianity. Yet, in the election of Donald Trump and his rise to power and prominence, what more than ever is being exposed, which I believe which must be expelled, expunged, and even excommunicated and exorcised from all Christianity is the pathology of white supremacy. Christian white supremacy may be an oxymoron of sorts, but it unfortunately and ashamedly is a very real pandemic in Christianity that stands in stark contrast and direct contradiction to the words and works of the very one they claim to believe and follow an Afro-Asiatic Palestinian Jew with hair like wool, feet like burnished bronze, publicly executed after an unjust trial by the Empire of Rome, working in collusion with a few prominent leaders of the dominant religious system of his day in order to silence his works, abolish his words, and disperse his followers. And for the record, Jesus was not Christian. So, so then, albeit there's nothing really Christian about Christian white supremacy, but it does beg the question, what is it and where did it come from? In, in order to answer these questions, we must come to terms with a few inconvenient truths. And it's been said in times of great crisis and turmoil, the truth is often seen as a revolutionary act. Christian white supremacy is in part a pathology deeply embedded in religious beliefs, behaviors, and practices of those who use the Bible and term Christian in order to cultivate a Christian worldview that ultimately supports and maintains the preservation of all things white and its accompanying privilege. These beliefs and doctrines are based on a biblical hermeneutic, or if you will, an interpretive lens, constructed primarily, if not singularly, by Eurocentrism and colonization, 
in order to maintain power and control and exert dominance for the ultimate purposes of economic exploitation. As enslaved West Africans called heathens by their Christian slave captors were usually baptized before they boarded slave ships. And for the record, the largest and most notorious slave ship was named Jesus. It's important to note that Western Christianity in general, but, but unfortunately much of American evangelicalism in particular as it exists today, was born in the womb of slavery and is now propagated by many seminaries and advances in political and economic power through its insidious marriage to nationalism, as evidenced by Franklin Graham's endorsement of Donald Trump, Jerry Falwell's endorsement of Donald Trump, Robert Jeffries, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, his endorsement of Donald Trump, and also the 81% of white evangelicals in America who voted for him despite his racism, sexism, misogyny, Islamophobia, xenophobia, not to mention his innumerable private and public moral failures. And why, and, and, and why did the overwhelming majority of white evangelicals support his candidacy? Well, he did a great job at dog whistling, and he exploited many of their deepest fears, America's changing face, and the inevitable browning of America, and thus the need to revert back to this deeply mythologized time when the nation was pure, that's code for white, when the nation was clean, that's code for white, and when the nation was Christian, that's code for white. They bought it, they sold it, they elected it, because white supremacy, unfortunately, beloved, will use any cover to shield itself. Sometimes that cover is a white sheet, sometimes it's a black robe, and sometimes it's a cross. But let me be clear. Donald Trump is not the disease or the pathology, but he is a crude expression of the culture of white supremacy, who just so happened to be fully embraced by many white evangelical Christians, leading one perhaps to believe or surmise, unfortunately, that much of perhaps white evangelicalism is in fact a form of white Christian supremacy, and its practitioners are numerous, politically activated, and not just white. But I'm absolutely convinced now than ever before, after seeing the voting demographics of 2016 and the 2016 presidential election, that all Christians don't necessarily worship the same God. <laughs> According to the God of Christian white supremacists, as exhibited in much preaching, practice, belief, and behavior, we should worship Jesus, not follow him. We should have faith in Jesus, but not the faith of Jesus. We should be saved from our sin, but not from racism, sexism, and economic despair. We should worship the written word and not follow the word made flesh. We should value a fetus in the womb more than a child running hungry on the street. We should be colorblind and not see people according to the skin they're in. We should build walls that keep others out and not bridges that take folk over. We should fear and destroy any faith that's not the Christian faith. And we should make the national agenda this God's agenda. These deeply held doctrines and systems of belief baked in a crack pot of reckless religious rhetoric, steeped in a negation of history, Boiled by unexamined racist theologies, combined with a pinch of patriotism, cooked on a stove bought by plantation capitalism, legitimized by legislators, preserved in public policies, 
and packaged by public opinion becomes the main meal the majority of Americans are fed when converting to Christianity and the main menu Americans associate, unfortunately, with Christianity. Only the privileged can relegate their faith to the warming of the heart and not the warming of one's physical body because of an inability to pay the rent. This pathology of Christian white supremacy cloaked with the garment, unfortunately, of much of American evangelicalism stands in stark contrast to the Christian teachings of folk like Dolores Williams. Pick up one of her books. Emily Towns, Ada Maria Asasi Diaz, Walter Wink, Walter Brueggemann, Oscar Romero, Gayrod Mill, Wilmore, John Kennedy, and of course, John Kennedy, and of course, the recently departed James Cone, who stated unapologetically that if you really read the Bible, the essence of the gospel is black, not in color, but in condition. I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. In the many ways when I discuss and deconstruct and demythologize American evangelicalism in general and Christian white supremacy in particular, I often feel like Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of John chapter 20, arriving at the empty tomb on Resurrection Day and stating to the attendant, they have taken away my Jesus and I do not know where they have laid him. And according to the tradition of my ancestors as practiced in the word Sankofa, which means the only way out is to go back through. I think it's time that people of Christian faith everywhere go back and find Cone's Jesus and make him known. Ashe, so now let's talk. Testing. Okay. Yes, we're good. We're good. We're good. Reparations. I'm going to start with the word reparations. Reparations. Sure. What, what would be appropriate reparations on a national level, appropriate reparations ch- for the church? <laughs> so there's, word, there's this word called repent mm. in Christianity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we, we have to start with the fact that before we can get to reparations, there's got to be a public acknowledgement mm. of the sin of the enslavement of human beings mm. and how we as a nation, in part, have profited from and built this country on an enslaved economy mm. to which, in large measure, the church has been in collusion with. So we have to start, I, I believe we have to start with a, a public acknowledgement of that um, and, and then strategically um, think about what it looks like to do reparations for and with the people who unfortunately, because of their enslavement, don't have much of their genealogy or ancestral history to go back to. Um, so when I think about, for example, the decriminalization of marijuana, We spent years locking individuals up on the farce of the war on drugs. And we know that there is going to be eventually, inevitably, the legalization of marijuana. And we ultimately know who's going to profit from that. And at the same time that certain communities of privilege are profiting from the decriminalization and the legalization of marijuana, we've got young black and brown boys and and girls and women and men in jail. So maybe there ought to be some set-asides for those communities that were destroyed by that public policy. And that money ought to go back to those communities and those persons. In white majority churches, um, you might find a defensiveness. I'm not a racist. Um, and how do you how do you move the person 
to from I am not a racist to anti-racism work? <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, so no one wants to be, well, most folks don't want to be labeled a racist. Uh, and racism and white supremacy is a system. It is embodied in systemic structures that are lived out by processes and protocols from which the majority dominant white culture benefits from, right? Um, so you can be arguably a good father and a racist. You could be a good spouse and a racist. But what happens is because we don't enter the conversation often the right way, people begin to put up their defense mechanisms and hear, I am bad. And when people hear, I am bad, they hear shame. And it is hard to move people from shame into kind of, a, a, of an ecosystem of equity and where we can talk openly uh, about really their white-skinned identity. No, did anybody here ask to be born white? Okay, all right. Anybody here ask to be born black? No, right, right. You were born in the skin that you were in. But there's a system at work that we have to identify and address how it is unfortunately and inequitably causing certain people a great deal of damage and destruction while other people profit from it. So, so we've got to enter the conversation the right way. And, and most of those conversations will not be public. They need to be private. Mm. Uh, they need to be around our Thanksgiving dinner table with those family members. They need to be at our church council meetings when we hear certain dog whistled words, well, you know, they, or, you know, they're not like, a, and, and begin to define, well, what do you mean by they and them? So we, we've got to learn how to enter the conversation um, and, and, and be able to help someone deconstruct what Peggy McIntosh calls that unearned invisible knapsack of privileges that folks have been carrying. Which, which is like kind of like waking up on third base thinking you hit a triple. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, that's, that's how I kind of define, you know, you just woke up on third base and you got all the, but it's not because you actually were behind the plate much of the time. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn how to enter the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, which we're doing. Yes. Tonight. We are. So praise, praise God for this opportunity. Um, is it just a lot safer to talk about personal sin than systemic sin in the church? Yeah. Absolutely. So a part of uh, what I was referencing, this, this um, I mean, the fancy, the academicians use the word biblical hermeneutic. But it is, it is a construct that's been created to look at the Bible through the lenses of privilege. So, for example, when Paul mentions principalities and powers... We don't think of empires that have political systems attached to it. We think of otherworldly. And so we disconnect from the truth of the text because to connect with the truth of the text challenges our worldview. So much of the Christian interpretive lens based upon, in part, uh, Eurocentrism basically confirms what we really want to believe. And that is that we are the best, we are the brightest, and, um, and that in the end, we're going to triumph. So, 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 so much of that interpretation is built on triumphalism. I'm right, you're wrong. Right? So uh, we have that, you know, part of this is being able to deconstruct how we interpret the Bible. I think that that's at the root of a lot of it. You know, you can visit museums. There's a, there's a museum in, in Washington, D.C. called the Bible Museum. Uh, and in the lower level, they have what they call the slave Bibles. Hmm. And these slave Bibles um, were, you, you remember when folks used to read the newspaper? And if somebody didn't want you to read something, they would cut out the article? Right, well, these slave Bibles had portions of it cut out hmm. that referred to wow. 
the Israelites leaving the oppressive regime of Egypt and Pharaoh. And it had portions cut out, like in Christ there is neither male nor female, Jew or Greek, slave, all are one in Christ Jesus. All those, all those liberative portions were cut out. So that was what was left there was slaves obey your masters. Let the women be silent. Right? Those kinds of things. So in many ways, the gospel was used to propagate and perpetuate, you know, the continued enslavement of the people. In, in my home state, there's a very large uh, evangelical church. My home state of Iowa, there's a very large evangelical church in suburban Des Moines. And I, I keep an eye on their social media every now and again and their website. And um, I'll never forget the, uh, the one image I saw of a Bible with the American flag and a gun. Uh, and that was... Uh, uh, kind of a rah rah, uh, go God, guns, flag, all of that wrapped together. And I really appreciated your mention of the connection between so much of evangelicalism and nationalism, right. and how dangerous, how very dangerous that is. Well, you know, the biblical text talks about freedom, and America talks about freedom. And so when we read passages out of Galatians that you know, Christ has set you free for freedom's sake, or when we read things like Isaiah, you know, mounting up with wings as on eagles, the national emblem, those things marry together from an unexamined mind that is open can create what we're talking about, a Christian white supremacy. You know, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's just, it's just the, it's, it, there, there's a very, um, you know, innocuous way that, that those things kind of occur when you marry those two together. And then, of course, on the dollar bill, we say, in God, we trust. And many folks would say that our founding fathers were Christians. And, and so there are, all of these, there are all of these stories and narratives that we continue to repeat mm-hmm. as myth, and we turn the myth into fact. And unless we are willing to have a serious conversation and deconstruct that, and I think part of the challenge of deconstructing it is when you have lived a life of incredible privilege and you have had a clarifying moment, you begin to question the totality of the life you've lived. So it becomes a challenge to how do I live this life now knowing what I know? And, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Linus with the blanket. He's had it for so long, you can't imagine him without it. And many folks hold on to a lot of that rhetoric that's unfortunately, I believe, deeply embedded with a very incorrect hermeneutic. Um, and, 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 and what that could mean for a pastor who goes down that path is you, you, your church might be a little empty on Sunday morning. You start because you know in the church you got you know you got all kind of folk in the church and you start you start talking about this and it begins to it begins to challenge people where they are in terms of their economy mm-hmm. and and that's that's difficult. It's very threatening. It's very threatening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, any questions at this point? If you could hand your questions to the middle aisle. Toward the middle aisle, we'll have one of MCCLV's ushers, if you could pick up those questions at this time. Just a reminder that this event is being live streamed. And we have pharaohs today. Yes. We have pharaohs today. The economic exploitation uh, continues today. Um, What are some ways as church communities, as communities of faith, uh, that we work against that power? that economic power, the corporatization? Well, I, I mean, we have to have open conversations like we're having tonight, and, and, and we have to start those conversations with community agreements in which we may not agree on everything, but we're going to practice unconditional regard for one another. <laughs> and, um, you, you, you know, you, you, we can't fix what we're unwilling to face. And, and in order to do that, we've got to be truthful. And I have found much of the church is very transactional. 
And transactional is not necessarily truthful. Uh, to be truthful means, in part, I am willing to render myself vulnerable for the purposes of us journeying together. And sometimes we may agree, and sometimes we may disagree, but I'm willing to have the conversation with you. And, and we, we've got to be we've got to be willing to enter that conversation as churches and in our churches as, as co-equal laborers who are trying to strive for the same thing. Um, I'll, I'll return to Pharaoh's and the NIZ in just a moment. Oh, boy, uh, but yeah. um, but uh, I do want to address some of the questions that have come in okay. from the audience. Um, suggested reading. You suggested some authors. Can you yes. suggest some book titles? Sure. Absolutely. So I, I would say anything by James Cone. Uh, James Cone uh, died this last past year, and he was a professor at Union Theological Seminary. He's a professor of systemic, excuse me, systematic theology. Uh, and he has a couple of books that are uh, worth reading. God of the Oppressed is one. And the other one is The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And the reason why he said that was as he went to Union Theological Seminary, his, his hero was Karl Barth. Mm. And as he began to read Barth, he said he was, he was just amazed that that great theologian didn't get the connection that Jesus was crucified on a tree and how many black bodies have hung from trees. Um, because in his opinion, theology ought to be able uh, to help aid people in their current construct. Um, and, and, and so I would read anything by James Cone, um, uh, Dolores Williams, who has died a couple of years ago, was a womanist theologian, uh, African-American, and she uh, wrote a book called Sisters in the Wilderness, Sisters in the Wilderness. Uh, anything by her, I, I believe, is is good and appropriate. And also, Kane Hope Felder, who uh, was professor of theology uh, at Wesley Theological Seminary, wrote a few books. One of them, Troubling Biblical Waters. Troubling Biblical Waters. Uh, Howard Thurman. Uh, yes. We, yes. Howard Thurman. Uh, we yes. used a quotation from him last Sunday for Pentecost Sunday, and he talked about the Holy Spirit um, being led by the Holy Spirit as a willingness to go against the spirit of one's times. Yes. And that was uh, just such a powerful uh, uh, thinking about the Spirit, yeah. a willingness to go against the spirit of one's times. Yeah. Have, have, have you all heard of Howard Thurman? Anybody? Okay. Right, so I know the preachers have in the house. I know you all have heard. You, you heard of him by default. You had How, Howard Thurman is, is one of my heroes. Uh, Howard Thurman, just a little bit about him, um, uh, was uh, a professor at Morehouse College. And of course, Morehouse College was the school that graduated Martin Luther King Jr., uh, that uh, graduated Maynard Jackson, Andrew Young. I, mean, I believe much of what Atlanta currently is mm -hmm. is due, in fact, to mm -hmm. that little college mm -hmm. that believes in providing academic excellence to African-American males. Um, and uh, Howard Thurman uh, and Benjamin Elijah Mays, who was the president at the time when uh, Dr. King was a student, he graduated high school at 15, he entered, entered uh, Morehouse at 16, uh, and he would listen to Howard Thurman and Dr. Mays, and uh, Dr. Thurman was the first person of black African heritage who met with Mahatma Gandhi, and, and Gandhi said, as he entertained and had audience with him, he said, come and tell me something. I have a question for you, Dr. Thurman. And Dr. Thurman said, well, what's the question? He said, well, how can you as a person, this was in, in the 30s, so this was Jim Crow, how can you be a Christian with all that the Christian church has done to perpetuate Jim Crowism, the enslavement of black folk, 
He said, I have no problem, God. He said, I have no problem with, with your Jesus. I like Jesus. I don't like his followers. <laughs> so Dr. Thurman came back and thought about that for a long time, and he wrote a book. I would encourage you to get it. It was in Dr. King's briefcase when he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, and it's called Jesus and the Disinherited. And it's, it's like 80 pages. You can, you, can, you can read through it. But it's a book that basically deconstructs the imperial notion of Christ that's enshrined in stained glass and reclaims Christ to be the son of man or humanity. This earth in Christ, who is both fully divine and fully human, but this Christ who ties his fate to the struggle of a dispossessed people which is not the dominant narrative of the church then, nor is it now. Mm -hmm. So I would say read anything by Dr. Thurman. And then the assassination in 1968 of Dr. King was in Memphis, and he was there for to support sanitation workers. He was there working against economic exploitation. And that continues in 2019. Uh, A question, what do you think of Dr. William Barber uh, and uh, Reverend Theo Harris and the Poor People's Campaign? I'm familiar with with Reverend Barber. He and I uh, both, um, at the same time, several years ago, uh, were inducted into the Morehouse Martin Luther King Board of Preachers. So I'm familiar with with Dr. Barber, and he and I have been on the same venue. And... um, and, and, and know each other, um, I think he's a breath of fresh air. Um, and, and I think what he's doing is needed. Um, he is challenging the body politic to have a conversation outside of what it means to be middle class. Mm. He's interjecting the word poor, um, which most politicians don't talk about, right? They talk about the middle class, and, but no one talks about poor folk. Mm. Uh, because poor folk are relegated to a condition in which the perception is they don't vote, therefore they don't matter. So, so he, he has brilliantly, uh, he calls it fusion politics, fusion politics. He's brought together people who, no, I've never seen anything like it. I was at one of his rallies. He brought together folk that you would never think would be in the room. White evangelicals, black Baptists. And gay folk and lesbians and folk that we, you would never think they'd be in the same room. And they're in the same room worshiping, singing, and, and be, because he understands that our fate is tied together through a common thread called struggle. And until we're able to see the struggle and appreciate the struggle in each other's lives, we're going to continue to live very insular and lose. And he's done that really, he's done that brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. Um, and he's deconstructed the text. So I think it's needed. One thing, I, I gave a presentation at a, a local church a couple weeks ago on um, LGBT and uh, moving toward LGBT acceptance and spirituality. And one of the things I recommended is attend and support a minority community church uh, from time to time. Yes. Um, and Metropolitan Community Church happens to have a majority of LGBT-identified worshipers. There are many Latino churches, African-American churches. Yeah. 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 Um, yes. What do you think are the immediate steps that our young people need to take to help make a change? Oh, my God. These questions, these are, these are like, how do we solve world peace? I mean... <laughs> Um, read the question again. <laughs> what are some immediate steps that our young people, so young people, need to take to help make a change? What's our word for young I people? Think young people I, I think the question presupposes that young people aren't making the change. Hmm. And I see most of the change that I see are coming from young people hmm. who are gathering outside of the relics of religious traditions. That when the spirit in the church is not moving, you get a Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. Young people. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, so I think young people are making differences in ways, but those ways often aren't noticed by the status quo. Um, but they need to be given avenues and opportunities 
to be able to speak their truth in real time. Um, but I, I, you know, if, if we look at the history of the United States, specifically as it relates to the civil rights movement, there was a great divide in the civil rights movement between Dr. King uh, and others, specifically folks like Ella Baker uh, who, and, and SNCC, uh, who believed that the movement was the young people's to embody. And Freedom Summer that happened in 1964 in Mississippi was a movement of registering Mississippians uh, by college students and by young people. So I see young people doing incredible things. I think they're making incredible differences. I think we don't notice them. Uh, they're off our radar. And oftentimes when we invite them into, as we want to invite other people who are diverse by gender, age, race, sexual orientation, when we invite them into our space, we have not learned how to be hospitable. So we invite them to our space, but the menu and the agenda doesn't change. So we want junior board members, junior. But when you invite someone of difference to your space, automatically the space should recalibrate and change. But it doesn't. So we say, why can't we get any young people in the church? If I hear one more pastor say that, I'm, you know, but when they come into the church, you know, we, we are not willing to recalibrate in order to meet their needs. And then we say, well, where are they at? Where are they at? You know, uh, which, is, which could be said of black folk and other folk. You know, when people of difference enter a space, um, that space is going to change. Mm -hmm. And what we're really saying is we want difference to enter our space, but we don't want their difference to change our space. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, good questions. How can we fight the increased blurring of the line between church and oh, state? Boy. Mike Pence, Judge Kavanaugh, Jerry Falwell, Reverend Graham, others. Repeat the question again. <laughs> yes. How can we fight the increased blurring of the line between church and state? Our, our religious beliefs and our traditions deeply inform our worldview and who we are. And, and they bear into light in terms of how we vote mm. and who we vote for. So let, let's not kid ourselves in thinking that we're going to sanitize people at the voting booth and mysteriously they're not going to vote their quote-unquote values. Um, but I will say we have to decide if we want to be a civil society. And I don't mean civil by, like, respectable. I mean, if, in fact, we're going to be a civil society, that means that no one specific racial or religious tradition can dominate the other. Right? That's, so if we're going to be a civil society, no one voice should be louder than the other. Uh, and that that should that should play into public policy, but but it doesn't. And much of our public policy is built around deeply embedded religious traditions mm -hmm. of how we define what's legal and what's not legal. That's another conversation for another time. <laughs> how do we make white privilege apparent to those who are proud of what they have accomplished and do not see the role of privilege in their success? <laughs> Boy, these are, these are you are. You're making me work tonight. I, repeat the question again, yes. sure. please, one sure. more time. How Boy, do we? How do we make white privilege apparent to those who are proud of what they have accomplished and do not see the role of privilege in their success? I got here on my own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I worked oh. hard. I did this by myself. Well, you know, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> for, for every person, I always say that you may not know it, but every one of us is standing on the shoulders of another. Yes, yes. Now, some of us are standing on the shoulders of folks that wanted to support you. And some folks are standing on the shoulders of others who didn't mm. have a choice. Mm. Um, and I think we have to also 
you know, in the words of Joan Rivers, can we talk? <laughs> we have to help white people understand that they're white. Hmm. And here's what I mean by that. You know, when we do diversity and inclusion and racial training, and when you start talking about privilege and people come up with, well, I've worked hard for everything I got. And I, in other words, they're saying, I wasn't able to benefit from my whiteness. Um, and then all of a sudden, people become Irish <laughs> and German. And not, so, so people go back to their ancestral history and, and want to claim that heritage and the struggle they had, but not want to talk about how they've been able to integrate into whiteness that is the American culture from which they have all benefited from. Uh, moved out the ghetto into the suburban neighborhoods uh, where many of our families are still rele relegated to. So, so we have to help folk certainly um, acknowledge hard work and dedication, but also acknowledge the structures that were in place to help them benefit from that. And, 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 and we have to do that oftentimes uh, with the precision of a surgeon scalpel yeah. Yeah. So, that, so that we don't destroy someone or shame someone, but to get them understand actually, here's what I say, when black and brown people benefit from public policy, white folk benefit from public policy. You would not have an ADA without the Civil Rights Act. When the lowest boat in the ocean rises to meet the other vessels, all of the other boats rise. That's just the way it works. So, so to think, well, oh, well and the thinking is around scarcity. They're going to take something from me. Yeah. Well, you got everything. <laughs> What am I, you know? Um, there's never so, enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's never mm -hmm. enough. So, and, you know, and so the same folk that believe in scarcity don't read that scripture about the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yeah. Right? Um, so it's just, it's just interesting how that works. But we, we, if I win, you don't lose. But the thinking is if I win, somehow you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. And that is what the danger of the construct of racism has done to the American psyche. It's impacted mm. and affected us all to the mm. point that in the next 30 years, this country is not going to look like this room. And if you've isolated your children, they will not be competitive in a brown country and a globalized economy. So the people that really lose from having this conversation aren't black and brown folk. Mm. Because black and brown folks have learned to, 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 to bob and weave, to make bricks without mud and straw. White folks have it because of privilege. So now, as the nation changes racially, if folk aren't able to recalibrate themselves and examine themselves, ultimately, they're going to lose. And, and that's going to be very sad. So, long answer to a short <laughs> question. How do we address white supremacy in law enforcement? Oh, man. <laughs> really? Oh, boy. Uh, we have to have, so, so I think that police officers, there should be ordinances, obviously, where police officers should live where they work, right? Uh, that's the first thing. Mm, yeah. They should know yeah. the members of the community. Yes. That's, that's yes. be, because, because much of policing is transactional um, and not relational. Uh, so officers should live where they work and then obviously should, should have some level of training around um, biasness and what it means to have implicit bias. If you haven't seen the movie Crash, See the movie Crash. Yes. If you've seen it, go back and see it again. That movie, I think, is one of the most brilliant movies on race that was ever created and is overlooked. And I don't want, I don't want to give the plot away, but the story, one of the vignettes is about a white police officer who's interacting, who's interacting with a medical professional who happens to be a black woman and then engages in some inappropriate behavior and sexually assaults another black woman who he ends up saving oh. coming into contact with. So I, I won't, don't, yeah, don't, don't tell it all. Um, it's a good movie. 
So see that, so see that movie. But I think implicit bias training, um, mm-hmm. and I think also living, you know, living where they work is are, are two critical things. Um, and yes, yeah, so absolutely. To uh, how can Christians, especially white Christians, um, remain silent in light of all the videos and Black Lives Movement NFL protest? Well, we've well, kind that's of a, been... That's, <laughs> that's a question to you, not to me. I'm not, I'm not white. Um, so I don't, I don't know. You won't have to... You, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean... Um, I think we've just heard that all, all the structures well, that mean, have been... Yeah. I, I mean, to go down the path that and... we're talking about is really to go into an area where you begin to deconstruct the totality of who you've been. And that's, for most folks, that's scary. You know, that's, that's, you know, uh, there were some folks in the civil rights movement, pastors, um, rabbis, who joined Dr. King in Selma. And when they came back, their spouses had packed their bags up and put them on the porch. And their churches had sent them letters. We didn't sign up for this. So they literally lost their economic well-being as a result of engaging in the struggle. And if you're really serious about deconstructing racism and white supremacy, I don't think you can do it with integrity without there being some level of personal sacrifice. Um, And it there's probably going to be an elimination of some of your Facebook friends. You know, the pew may have more, the pew may have more, more availability on Sunday morning than usual. I'm serious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You may be the only one in your son or daughter's bleacher. That's what it means. There's a relegation of social isolation that comes as a result of you being white and joining yourself to a people that you don't necessarily have to. That, that's, that's a sacrifice. And, and that has some deep psychological impact that I think has to be dealt with at some point on that transformative journey. And certainly the call for Christians is sacrificial living. Um, easier said than done. I read sometimes that somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Easier said than done sometimes. Do churches do churches have responsibility for mobilizing discouraged voters to combat injustice in our country? Or is that someone else's job? Do, do churches have a role in uh, have a responsibility for mobilizing discouraged voters? Do we have a responsibility to encourage people to uh, take part in civic engagement. <laughs> engagement. Yes. Uh, I mean, I am a product of the black church. I uh, grew up in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which, by the way, for the record, in the 18th century was started by Richard Allen in Philadelphia because as he and Absalom Jones went to worship at St. George's Methodist Church, they were asked to leave the altar and pray in the balcony mm. because there was no colors allowed. Mm. And that is what gave birth to the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So the black church is, and, I don't want, and the black church is not monolithic either, mm-hmm. but, but, but has had a dominant, has played a dominant role in civic engagement because there's been no separation from one's faith and one's real lived mm-hmm. experience. So when you walk into the house of worship, walk into the sanctuary, uh, you hear those words differently um, uh, because of your struggle of being in black or brown skin. Um, and so, so uh, it's not by mistake that most of the mass meetings that happened in the latter 50s and also the 60s, much of them happened in churches mm-hmm. um, because those were, those were places of social gatherings that were safe where one could speak their truth and also mobilize people uh, for the struggle. So I, I think they have a responsibility, but... Mm-hmm. A um, continued responsibility. Yeah, right. Absolutely. This is an interesting question. Could you address the not-so-subtle Christian white supremacy and privilege in the mainline Protestant churches, not just the evangelical churches? <laughs> 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 
the so-called progressive churches. No one escapes racism. All right. right. So no one escapes racism. Mm -hmm. uh, no one escapes the impact of racism or white supremacy mm -hmm. or white nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, uh, yes, is there, is, there, is there racism in the mainline church? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I attended a mainline seminary. You know, and you all know what we mean by mainline, right? You all Presbyterian and and mm -hmm. and those seminaries of higher education that you know I call them Jesus schools. Um, uh, much of the thinking that is there, outside of perhaps one or two professors of color that may teach womanist theology, liberation theology, are all there predominantly concretizing a Eurocentric lens that is very much steeped uh, in, in white domination. Now, they don't say that. No one says that, you know, no one, no, no, you know. Um, but, but what you're doing is, is paying for an education that helps to solidify a worldview in which you will be on top. Uh, so is it present? Yeah, it absolutely is present. And I think, so getting back to the mainline church, <laughs> unlike other churches, most mainline churches require their pastors to go to seminary. And so seminaries are the breeding ground that can either put one's fire out um, or light one's fire up or perpetuate a thinking that is not only antiquated but incorrect at best racist at worst. So our seminaries accredited by the Association of Theological Schools, ATS. Um, unfortunately, most of them, and they will tell you this themselves, are training pastors for a church that no longer exists. Um, so, so, and that's not to put all the weight of ministry on a pastor, but it is to say that most mainline seminaries that I know of require that MDiv degree for entrance into the pulpit. And that's the place that forms thinking. Um, and, and so seminaries have to also be, be dealt with. And one of the things that mainline denominations can do at the judicatory level, because most mainline seminaries receive funding right. from their denomination, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists. Um, if that national religious body has a certain stance around race and diversity that's not being embodied in their seminary faculty, then they ought to be able to withhold some funds. Mm -hmm. That's what I, mm -hmm. as you know. Yeah. Um, this is getting a little bit more specific about one particular mainline denomination. Oh, okay. Do you think that the schism in the United Methodist I knew Church... It. I how could I not? <laughs> Do you think the schism in the United Methodist Church is really about the African Methodist churches rising up against the perceived agenda of white Methodist Church of the USA, or is it a, a is it a response to colonialism? Um, <laughs> oh man, we're still on Facebook <laughs> yeah, okay. Live, right? <laughs> yes, we are still live. Okay. Some of my best friends are Methodist. I'm going to say that to begin with. Uh, well, seriously, I did not attend the meeting. Uh, full disclosure, I went to a Methodist seminary. And, and I did, I did uh, my pastoral internship at a United Methodist church. And um, so... What I had mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, that one can embody a theology that supports white supremacy and not necessarily be white. Control. So I'm not saying all the African United Methodist churches, but there has been a strange partnership, uh, a peculiar partnership between many of the African United Methodist churches and the Southern, not all white United Methodist churches, let's, let's be clear, the Southern United Methodist churches who are all supporting the same biblical hermeneutic around sexuality. 
Right. Yeah. So, so this, this, when we talk about this biblical hermeneutic, it is embedded deeply and cuts across race. Um, and I, I think that that's what we're seeing a lot of. I mean, who would ever think, you know, that, that, that African United Methodist and white Southern United Methodist would forge an alliance, mm-hmm. right? But, but that hermeneutic, that interpretation, um, their approach to that, to those scriptures have formed that alliance that has then caused them to uh, move the general body in the direction that it did. It was helpful to me when you described Christian white supremacy as pro-control, that it's pro-control and, you know, and how many other issues that, that control uh, comes up with. Um, what one question would you want to ask Reverend Rick Gold, is it? I'm sorry, whoever asked That's the question. That's him right there, sitting in the fourth pew back. Oh. <laughs> but what one question would I like to ask him? Him, yes. <laughs> to ask Reverend. What one question would I want to ask you? Did you write that question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to. Your I'm pastor gonna... is sitting alongside of you, so, <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah. I guess you know you put me on the spot. I'll put you on the spot. Um, what one question would I like to ask you in particular? Okay. Well, you are a, last time I checked, you are a white male. You were ordained in the United Church of Christ. You belong to the historic St. John's United Church of Christ, located, I believe, on 6th and Walnut Street in the city of Allentown that has a great historic presence. And you recently made the bold, bodacious decision to hire an unapologetic woman of color to be your pastor. <laughs> so, I won't know what led to that decision. <laughs> Inquiry minds, I'm sure she might want to know too. So you answer, that's the question I have for you since you asked me the question. I don't know if we need a mic on you, but... That's what you say when you're thinking about the answer. You know that, right? I know that trick. (laughs) I wasn't on a part of the call committee, but I was on the church consistory uh, when this process was going through. And um, I remember once uh, the... uh, yeah, yeah, Trudio down there was on the call committee. Um, the concern was raised by um, uh, the head of the call committee at the time at, at a consistory meeting that we were looking at candidates and there was one we felt was a little too progressive for our church. Um, and I spoke to him afterwards and said, Please don't try to manage the feelings of the congregation. Did you ask them what they meant by progressive? Because everybody uses these terms that have to be unpacked. Uh, No, I didn't. Uh, Because that's often code. Yeah. No, we speak in code. uh, Urban uh, means black. (laughs) You didn't know that? Usually urban means black, and like progressive means, hmm, she's not one, you know, they're they're not of our tribe or village. Usually. Usually, so I always like to, and, and just I just like to ask folks, well, what do you mean by that? So, uh-huh. okay, okay. Um, there was a real, st- I, I sense there was a struggle, um, um, but when the time came, um, it was almost unanimous in favor of uh, calling uh, Reverend Livingston. Yes, and you did. <laughs> Reverend Emily Livingston, senior pastor of the great St. John's United Church of Christ. Yes. So I just want to add something because I understood their concerns, and I had concerns, obviously. Mm -hmm. And one of the last questions I left them with was this, are you ready for me? Uh And it took them two and a half months to call me back. <laughs> no, this is true. This is true, Trudy, right? Because they, because I said to them, I don't want to be that pastor who comes in 
because I'm this, and this is not going to change. And I recognize that the search committee is interested in me, but you know your people. So are your people ready for this? Because when I come, I'm not going to change. And I don't want to be the pastor who comes, and then two, three months later, people are saying, oh, my God, what have we done? Because that's real. That's true. So when I asked the question, they had to wrestle with that, and they did. So here we are. And we're glad you're here. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to the Lehigh Valley. We have time for a couple more questions. And then I'm wondering, is, is anyone feeling like we could worship a little bit? Okay. I, I get the feeling that in this, the spirit in the sanctuary is that we could worship a little bit. And we'll ask MCCLV's music and worship director, Brian Jones, uh, to come forward. A um, couple more questions. Do you feel civil rights are being removed or revoked right before our eyes and Jim Crow is slowly returning? Do you feel that way? That's a rhetorical question, right? <laughs> yes, and yes. 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 I do. Uh, I mean, that's, it's, that's very, I mean, to me, it's very apparent. Mm. You know, uh, our nation is deeply divided. Mm. And, you know, one, one thing that our current political climate has done is it's made, it's made this conversation inescapable. It's made this conversation inescapable. Um, and as I said in my remarks, you know, uh, Donald Trump or that administration, that's, that's not our disease. That's not, that's, the pathology was here long before. Um, but we've never had an honest conversation. And, and, and those conversations have to marry not just the head, but also the heart. They've got to be some real conversations that move the needle in ways that people are willing to make a sacrifice. But yes, I, I believe that the things that have been fought for, uh, the civil rights and the liberties, uh, are, are being wiped away. Mm. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is, much of it is steeped in fear. Mm. And I think if we could be honest with ourselves tonight, we're in a church, so we might as well be honest with ourselves. Um, I think there's a fear that that the deep and continued mythologizing of the American narrative is about to change, and what's going to happen if black and brown people are in control? <laughs> and will they do to us what we've done to them. And until, until we can have a conversation about that, I mean a real conversation about it, not slamming, until we can have a real, genuine conversation about the fears that people have. People voted against their own mm -hmm. self-interest. Mm -hmm. Which impacted their families and impacted the medical care that their mothers and fathers received because there is this deep abiding fear that if we are not in control, we are going to get relegated to a plantation. And I, I don't know everything I, that I need to know about black people, but, but I do know, having been black all my life, that black people overwhelmingly aren't about retaliation. I'm not saying every, I'm, I'm just, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly want equity and justice, not retaliation. To retaliate eats at the soul of the one that engages. So, you know, um, but, but I think there's that fear. There, there's that fear that 
and, 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 and I think it's not a mistake that, <laughs> you got to think about it. This nation post 9-11 elected truly an African-American. Like truly an African-American. <laughs> like his mama was white. His daddy was African. And post 9-11, he had the name Barack Hussein and the, but the coalition that was built, which in large part looked like Jackson's coalition in 1984, the Rainbow Coalition. And he brought folks together that would never be in the same room. And I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about his politics. I'm talking about the fact that this country, this country elected a person of black African heritage post 9-11. And his wife wasn't white. She all black from the south side of Chicago. And her mama was black. And their children are black. And they bought... The, uh, so, so it was like, and literally, the political powers stood and said, our ultimate goal is to make sure he's a one-term president. Because they were, I mean, they were thinking about the fact that this black family was occupying the White House, flushing the toilets. No, I mean, I'm being very serious. That's all of the things that go through. Like, they're using our stuff. <laughs> because that's what racism does. It eats at the very humanity and the soul of the one that carries it. And so they held the whole country hostage around their racism and white supremacy. Regardless of whether you believe in his policies or not. But simply, we have to stop it. And we got to roll back everything he's done. Mm. Not because it was bad, but because he was black. Mm. We got to erase this out the history book. We got to write, rewrite this history. Take out that paragraph on Barack Hussein. Look, let's skip over him, skip over 44, and let's just rearrange the arithmetic calculus. Let's just go from 41, 42, 43, 45. But that's, if you look at public policy, that's exactly what is taking place. And, that, and that's sad. Specifically by people who so want to engage in, in history. Right? That's sad. Do you have um, do you have hope and confidence that uh, these conversations are going to happen in the next years? You've you've said that we we need to have those uncomfortable conversations. Do you have hope and confidence that those conversations are going to take place? Yes, I mean I, I have hope, but, but definitely because there's always a remnant. There's always a remnant that is willing to go against the grain. Because once you know better, you got to do better. And once you've been blind and now you have sight, it's hard to go back. Um, you know, I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes that said, a mind expanded by new ideas cannot return to its former dimensions. So we have to have conversations. But in those conversations and in those rooms and at those church council meetings and at the water cooler, what, what we need... We don't. We, we have a lot of shipbuilders, people that build ships and want to set sail. We need some bridge builders, and bridge builders can hear what's not being said, and can say what needs to be said in the moment at the time. And as as long as we've got folk like that, uh, now in the in the Bible they call them prophets. Um, at, we, we we will always. Um, we will. Oh, I believe we will inevitably outlive this current conundrum and this American nightmare that we're in. Mm -hmm. Last question for tonight: What would societal repentance look like? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think. I mean, that's a big question. All of society to repent. Well. It, it, so, so societal repentance should, to me, show up in the form of equitable public mm -hmm. policy mm -hmm. that owns and understands 
that most all of our public policy is deeply entrenched, unfortunately, in racism and white supremacy. Um, dare I say even the ones that some people of color have benefited from. Um, this is structural. Mm -hmm. That then goes to the personal. So, so societal, I don't need a I'm sorry. I don't need I'm sorry. Um, you know, what we need are people elected that shorten the distance between human pain and public policy. Mm. That's what we need. Mm. And until we, and, and that's, that's not Republicans versus Democrats. Right. That's not right. Republican Democrats. That's not, right. that's not right. a Republican Democrat thing. That's it. These binaries and these, these linguistic constructs, right, left, conservative, liberal, as long as you stay in that box, you're, you're an easy target. But when you break out of that box, we're, we're talking about what it means to be human. And we've got to ask our, our elected officials locally and at the federal level, do you draft public policy by seeing people in their full humanity? Like in their full humanity. Do you know that this impacts their lives in innumerable ways that you may not see? Um, I think that that's what repentance looks like. You know, it doesn't look like a Hallmark card. Mm -hmm. It looks like an ordinance on inclusionary zoning mm -hmm. in a gentrified city. You want to decriminalize marijuana? Have some set-asides in the same black and brown communities that you busted and devastated, sent away to prison, and then wrote public policy said when they come back home they can't get public assistance. Mm -hmm. Fix that. <laughs> that's what repentance looks like to me, right? Um, that's what, and, and, and then and, and then make sure you know that that when you go to vote, voting should be a national holiday. Yeah. You know, yes. I mean that. So so that everybody can vote, like everybody can vote, um, so that we don't relegate people who don't vote to being lazy. Instead of saying, well, they got three jobs, five kids. Mm -hmm. They work in New York, they come back, the voting place is closed at 8, their bus leaves at 5, we don't have free unfettered absentee ballots, so they're lazy. Mm. Let's not, so, so, so let's make that a national holiday. Mm -hmm. See, all of those things together, to me, looks like reparations. Yeah. Yeah. That's what reparations look like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for those intense questions. <laughs> This has been a presentation of Metropolitan Community Church of the Lehigh Valley, a radically inclusive Christian community, worshiping and serving God through acts of justice and compassion. To find out more information about Metropolitan Community Church of the Lehigh Valley's worshiping times, programming and ministry opportunities, or to help support MCC Lehigh Valley's ongoing vision and mission, you can visit the church's website at mcclv.org or email the church at info at mcclv.info. All are warmly welcomed.